Hi, this is a tutorial in uh, 2.5D compositing uh, and the workflow that allows us to migrate between Photoshop and Nuke. So as you can see that I've got the matte painting open from the previous week's tutorial. This was my version of it. You can see that I've collapsed some of the panels up here so that I can see all of my layers in the stack. You can, this is actually a 4K image, you can see that I'm actually operating at only 17% uh, uh, magnification. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do um, as an intermediate step before going into, into Nuke is to flatten down our layer masks, our smart objects, our adjustment layers, etc. Um, this just makes uh, work and life in Nuke so much easier. It means that we're dealing with so, so many fewer nodes and it means that our alphas are so much more clearly defined. But it is really important that we retain this file. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start and I'm going to come to save as and I'm going to make a copy of this and I'm just going to call this flattened. and this is the one that I'm going to work with. So the integrity of my completed one is still intact. Okay, so I'm going to start by just whipping through these layers um, by turning them all off and now let's turn them back on. So there's my outline that I used to construct the photo bash initially, so I don't need that, so I can delete that. Um, this is my reference, uh, which don't believe I will need because I think that I've actually applied that higher up. Here it is in here. So that was just my reference. So I don't need that. I don't need that. Uh, this is my skyscape. I am going to need that. There's a UN saturation uh, adjustment layer that I've got on it. So I will need those. So let me focus on the foreground element. So this is my foreground layer and I've got a, I've got a color correction on that as well. There's my shadow from my tower. I don't want that at this stage. Just come below it. That's the ground plane before. So this is my uh, this is this is my foreground element. So what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to get my. Um, I'm just going to right click on the um, on the link there that connects the layer mask to the image. I'm just going to right click on that and I'm going to say apply layer mask and you can see now that the alpha gets baked straight into the layer directly. Now we've got an adjustment layer above it, I'm just going to hook that in as well so I'm just going to make sure that both layers are selected, right click and choose merge layers. Okay, so now that layer is entirely baked in, the adjustment layer and the layer mask are baked into that layer so I'm just going to call that foreground and then move on. Just bear in mind that some layers might have several adjustment layers on them, like this one for example, this Distant Mountains has got two adjustment layers atta attached to it, in which case we, will need need we would need to make sure that all three layers were selected before we merge them together. So let's take a look at this layer now, this stock layer. Okay, You can see that this has got the Smart Object icon associated with it. Now because Smart Objects are technically a file, a Photoshop file within a Photoshop file, the apply a layer mask op operation won't work. So if I right click on this now, you'll see that the apply layer mask is greyed out. It's not an option that's available to us. Therefore, for any smart object with a layer mask applied, we have to do something a little bit different. What we have to do is effectively turn both objects into a smart object. To do that, we basically select the layer and then we come up to this menu here now this is going to go outside of the screen capture area, but part way down here is an option which says convert to smart object. Okay, once we do that, you can see now that that has now become a smart object, but the now the alpha, the transparency from the layer mask is now baked inside. If we actually double click this layer to go inside it, you can see there's the layer mask inside there, and we can see the, the transparency that's actually been applied onto the image. Okay, so I'll close the smart object down and we're ready to move on. I'm going to get my main mountain layer here, this, this, this area here, and we can see that we've got an adjustment layer affecting it. So again, I'm going to right click on the link and say apply layer mask. 
and then I'm going to shift select the layer above so both are selected then I'm going to right click and choose merge layers from the option and we can see that now our main mountain is now flattened it's got it's got the transparency applied and the adjustment layer with the color correction has also been applied to the layer okay I'll do the same with the distant mountain so again turn it turn it on just turn that one off so there's no confusion again this has got a, a layer mask with some transparency which I need to flatten in so I just need to uh, select that again this is a smart object so I'm going to need to go up to the layers tab and choose convert to smart object which is going to bake it in and then I'm going to shift select the two adjustment layers above I'll just turn them on so we can see the effect of them and select all those by shift selecting and then right click and choose merge layers and that's flattened so I can now call that distant mountains okay the last one is the skyscape again I've got a smart object and an adjustment layer so I should just be able to select by shift selecting both right click and choose merge layers and now that's baked in I'll finish by applying the color correction you can see that color correction there on the on the tower just turn it on and off again and again this is a smart object with the transparency already baked in I just shift select both of those and then merge the layers and that's it so we've got uh, all of our layers now flattened down uh, we've got a U saturation <laughs> this is called U saturation but this is obviously our sky so I can rename that um, the stock image that's probably not that descriptive um, so we can see this is really sort of the mid-ground so that's what I'm going to call it and that is pretty much it the only other thing here is this global color correction which I'm just going to remove because I can apply that in um, in Nuke and obviously if I need to take a look at the levels adjustment and now that's been applied in order to replicate that in uh, in Nuke I can always go back to the original file to do that so I'm just going to delete that now so there are all my layers um, the only thing worth mentioning here is the tower shadow there when I bake that down it retained the smart filters that we discussed in the previous tutorial and we can see that my my blur effect on the shadow there the U saturation effect on the shadow there they are both uh, they're both intact so they'll be they'll be going through as part of the layer so we can see the the U and saturation which takes the color out it's just stuttering a little bit there they go so we can see the shadow and again that's that's baked into that particular layer so we'll save this this is the flattened image and now we're good to go so I've closed down Nuke and uh, sorry I've closed down Photoshop and, and opened Nuke um, so we can now make a start on um, on constructing this in the 2.5D workflow I'll start just by saving the script into my uh, into my project folder and I'll just call it um, one setup it'll automatically append with the nuke uh, the nuke uh, extension so I can do that and now I want to uh, come into the project settings and apply the uh, the relative path directory setup there so that um, so that we don't uh, have to go fishing around for our uh, files every time we reopen this project file And for working pro processes, I'm actually going to set this resolution to the same size as my um, as my map painting. Although that won't be the resolution in which we will view it in the end. We'll switch to a 16:9 aspect ratio. But for now, I'm just going to apply a 4K. We, if I'm just looking through to see if there's already one in the in the library, and there isn't, so I'm going to create a new one. So I'll just call it 4K underscore square. And 
4096 by 4096. Accept that, and that is now the resolution of a main display area. Okay, so I'm now going to bring in my script, and I'm going to do this the long hand way by bringing in a read node. And there's my flattened image, so I'm going to say open. And as I previously mentioned, here is the breakout layers uh, button, which is distinctive from any other buttons that you, uh, any other um, setup that you have in a read node when you're bringing in anything else other than a Photoshop file. Okay, so at the moment we can see on our node graph that all we've got here is just our, our main image. So I'm now going to break out the layers and we can see what happens. Just let me extend this across so that we can make get make more access to this real estate. And we can take a look at our uh, at our image. If we take a look at it just while it's connected to the Photoshop file, and I come into here, you can see that all of the different elements see the distant mountains, the foreground elements, the main mountains, etc. These are, they're all in, in their baked state, but you can see that then they're pre-multiplied and they're all a little bit messed up. But we can see that all the layers are there. And what's actually happening here is that they are being shuffled out. So in this case, the sky is being shuffled out. So basically what that means is that the, it's being retrieved from the channel set and it's being passed into the RGB or the RGBA. And then it's being cropped to the size of the actual useful pixels and not the size of the entire display area and then it's being merged over whichever is next in the path. And exactly the same thing's happening here. This is the uh, this is the distant mountain being shuffled there into the RGBA, cropped to its own size. You can see the crop boundaries here. If we didn't have the crop then the image would extend to the full display boundary and then that's merged. So when we get to the end of the script over here, we can see that the map painting has reconstructed itself. So in theory, if I if I just going to select that and hit two, so that we can just toggle between the final merge and the um, and the original plate, you can see apart from the, a little bit of transparency discrepancy on the uh, on the shadow of the tower, everything else is absolutely identical. Okay. Before I go any further, I'm just going to set this up for relative paths. So I just need to put the the two dots to make it go back a directory from the scripts and now the relative path is set up. Okay, so the upshot is that these uh, these merge nodes don't serve us at all because our, our goal isn't to reconstruct this image, our goal is to apply each of these different strands onto geometry of their own. So effectively what that means is I can take all of those merge nodes and delete them out. Okay, so now we're back to the uh, we're back just to sort of the different the different strands. At the moment we can still access them but we can only access them individually, we can't access them collectively. And this is really where we where we go from now in terms of building up the uh, the 2.5D setup. So I'll start from left and work my way to the right. So this is our sky. The first thing I'm going to need to do is, and I'm going to need to do this on all the layers, is to apply a pre molt node. This will essentially pre-multiply the image from the layer by its own alpha. So I'm just going to repeat that along the way. It will, I'm just hitting tab and it will remember my last operation. So I can just whittle my way through these quite quickly. There we go. We've got pre-molts on all of the different strands now. It's really important that you select each crop node in turn and apply the pre-molt node instead of uh, doing this by cut and paste or by cloning. And this is because the pre-molt node picks up the resolution from the incoming pre-multiply clip, that, which is basically defined in the crop. Um, and it will it will take it will take the range from the crop boundaries. Uh, which obviously differ from one strand to the next and so we have to 
basically allow it to set it up from scratch on each one of the images in order for the out for the alpha to be pre-multiplied correctly based on the pixels that are stored within each of these uh, each of these uh, strands now. So if we switch to any of these strands now we should see that they've all now got their own alpha reinstated and we're not looking at that messy alpha channel that we were seeing before in its own pre-multiplied state. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to come to my mid-ground. No particular reason uh, to do this, but I'll, I, I like to start sort of right, right, pretty much in the middle of the uh, of the of the Z space and we know that this is pretty much in the mid range. So I'm going to select the pre-mort for this and I'm going to add a card node. We don't want a card 3D, we just want the card geometry node. And that has now applied that and if we zoom in we can see that it's jumped us into 3D view and we can now see that our image has been projected onto this card. If I, if I scoot around as well, we can see that our card has been placed right in world space zero at its pivot point, which is aligned to the center of the piece of geometry. So we're going to be using a specific workflow, which will allow our cards to maintain the correct focal range and aperture settings as we push back into 3D space. This requires us to bring this information in from the original images. The stock image is one of the main images. I use this basically to get my perspective and it's one of the main, it's one of the central images in the actual map painting. Um, it's taken from a position on the bank from which the main map painting derives its perspective. By right clicking on this image it ought to be possible to acquire some of the metadata that was captured by the camera when the shot was taken. Let's see if we can do that. So I've just scooched back to last week's folder, so we can see the folder. It is our stock image, so if I right click on this and go to properties, and we can see in the details some information about it. We can see the camera make, we can see the camera model, we can see the f-stop, we can see the exposure time, the ISO, the focal length. We've got quite a lot of information here that we can use to set up our Nuke camera. So. So I've just typed uh, Fujifilm X100F, which is the, obviously the information that I got from the metadata, and I've just uh, asked for the sensor size there, um, and uh, brought up a search. The, and the one I'm looking for really is DP Review. I really like this website. It gives you some really nice information, really nicely presented. So it tells us it should tell us everything that we need to know in the specs. And the main thing we're going to need is we're going to need this, we're going to need the sensor size because essentially the sensor size tells us the horizontal and the vertical aperture of the, uh, of the camera. So we can see that that's 23.6 by 15.6. And the only other thing that we're going to need is the focal length, which we know the focal length is 23 because we saw that in the metadata. Okay, so I can close that down and get rid of my images and progress. So I'm going to build the rest of my 3D nodes. I'm going to add a scene node and I'm going to add a scanline renderer and I'm going to add a camera. That gave me a camera tracker. A camera. There we go. And I'm hooking that up to the scanline renderer. And I can essentially now use the scene to hook up to all of my um, all of my bits of geometry. Although it's just glitching at the moment. Okay, I'll come back to that in a second. The camera is what I'm really interested in for now. You can see that I've got my camera settings open. I'm just going to drag this across and. I need to go into the projection settings. And this is where we set our focal length and our horizontal and vertical aperture. So we know our focal length should be 23, so I can set that. And we know our horizontal aperture should be 23.6 and our vertical aperture should be 15.6. Okay. And as this is happening, 
hopefully you can see the uh, you can see the aperture changing as I scooch through those values. That's the vertical aperture. You can see that as I change the horizontal aperture and I take that into higher numbers. You can see how that is changing the view. So those now correctly match the main image of our map painting. So that's the first part of this little setup process done. The second part is to actually apply the same settings to the card node. The card node is really cool. It's got it's got these it's got basically a virtual lens which allows us to set these things up in the same way. So we can see we've got lens in focal and we've got lens in aperture. So our lens in focal is the focal length, so that needs to be 23. And then the lens in aperture is the horizontal aperture, which is 23.6. It won't need a vertical aperture in order to compute. So this camera now occupies exactly the same settings as our camera. I'm just going to switch into the top view so we can see this uh, a little bit more clearly. and just have my camera and my card active. I will have to just turn my nose to two so that I can have two working at the same time. We can see that both my camera and my, um, and my card are currently at world space zero. But if I get my card now and I start to push it in Z space, you can see that I can now move it along the Z axis. And because it's got the same aperture settings and focal length settings as the camera, it always stays true to the camera frustum. So I can now, if we apply this principle to all my layers, I can start to stack them all at different distances away from the camera. And I haven't got to worry about trying to scale and reposition my images because the card is going to do that for us just by using these simple settings. So all I need to do now is copy my card and paste one for each of my layers. I'm just dropping them into space just for now. I'm just going to do it for, for five of them and then just start to drop them onto the pre nodes across all my layers. Okay. I'll pause the screen capture and come back when that's done. Okay, I'll just increase that further so that I can open each of these. So I'm just going to open all of these up. Okay. And now let's... This is card one, which is my sky element. So I'm just going to push that way back. I'm just going to push that way back in space. It's got something like 12, maybe 15, so it's way back out there. Now I'll get my distant, distant mountain one and uh, move that. Let's go for some, let's go for 10. In reality, we, we reposition these and fine tune the, tune these once we've got our scene set up. And I'll explain why when we get to that stage. So this is the main mountain. I'll put that to about 8. This is our stock image, our mid-ground. I'll maybe put that to 5. Um, our foreground element, let's set that to something let's set that very close, something like 2. And then we've got our two tower elements. So my, they should be on a similar plane to my mid-ground. I set my mid-ground to 5, so I'm going to set these to 5 as well. Okay. So we can see all our layers across the across the depth axis of this of this scene, and we can see our camera sat at world space zero relative to those. So I'll just plug these into the scene on now. Hopefully they've stopped glitching like they were before. You can see that they're connecting up just nicely now. I'm going to hook my viewer into the scanline renderer and then I'm going to switch back to 2D view now. Okay, I missed my sky so I'll just put that in as well. 
and now we've got a reconstruction of our matte painting. There's a few little anomalies there that we can fix, but we'll do that once we actually start to animate the camera. I'm particularly concerned about the tower because obviously at the moment it's on the same axis as the ground and because of that it's getting partially obscured. I can fix that by uh, by moving it slightly. So there is the is the tower, which is currently on five. I've just moved it a, a tenth, and now it's in position. And I'll do the same with the uh, I'll do the same with the shadow. Okay, I'll move that. by a hundredth just to stick it behind the uh, the main building. So I guess the takeaway is if you've got to this stage and you, you're hooked up in this way you're looking at your 2.5D scene through the prism of the camera uh, so we're looking at this in 2D now even though it's built as a as a 2.5D setup if your matte painting is looking origin exactly the same as the original which we can see if we connect connect up here and now I toddle between them you can see that it's pretty much the same there's a few obvious things that we need to change like the uh, the transparency on the shadow and things like that but, uh, but but it's basically reconstructed itself very simple process and it's all down to the power of Nuke and the, uh, and the fact that it has this amazing capability through the card node to interpret the camera details and then apply those details so that our, whenever, wherever we push our, our layers back in 3D space, they're always going to uh, marry up and, and stay within the boundaries of the camera frustum. So, we now need to test this by putting an animation on our shot camera. And that is essentially the true test of how well we've positioned our various layers. Because what will happen is that they will, they will all displace differently from each other. Parallax, the, the, the concept that we've already been discussing. Um, and how they move relative to each other will determine the positioning, the accuracy of the positioning. And that's when we come back to our card node, and particularly to the Z, uh, to the Z attribute, and start to make fine-tune adjustments to our layers so that the so that the parallax looks right. Okay, so this is the first point now when we're actually wanting to start to look at this scene through the prism of the 2D camera. Uh, this is the first time that we need to switch away from our our square 4K view into the actual view that we're going to use to present this as a final image. So what we need to do is we need to reformat our scene. Um, I'm just going to put proxy on uh, just so that it refreshes more quickly and I don't get that sort of lag going on here. So I'm going to add a reformat node and I'm going to apply the reformat node to the background port of the scanline renderer. Now whatever I set now in the reformat node will basically override anything that we've got in the project settings, which is currently a 4K scene, and replace it with a new display format. And I'm just going to go for HD 1920 by 1080, and you can see that that now reframes my shot. And you can see that it's reframed my shot in a way that isn't great. Uh, we've lost the foreground information, we've lost a lot of our sky detail, but we should be able to get that back. Uh, through the repositioning and the animation of our shot camera. Okay, before I go any further, I'm just going to add a crop node below the scanline renderer. Okay, and the reason why I'm doing that is because the scanline, even though our reformat node is clipping our image to the to this nice 16.9 aspect ratio. All the pixel data that's in the 4K image around the outside is still active and still and, and Nuke is still trying to process it on every single frame. And as we start to animate that, that's going to become incredibly slow. So a good working practice always is to add a crop node, because the crop node has this little feature called black outside, which means that it basically doesn't delete the information that's around the outside, but what it does do is it basically eliminates it from being processed. So it's still available to us. Um, it just means that Nuke has, isn't going to be previewing it and, and having to sort of process that information on a frame by frame basis as we start to review the camera animation. It just contains itself to the boundaries of the shot. You can see it's defined there within the, uh, within the crop node itself. Okay, so let's get on with this camera animation. So what I'm going to do to start is I'm going to double click my camera to get my camera settings up. I need to come into the actual camera properties um, and I'm going to affect the translation and rotation. 
So I'm making sure that I'm on the first frame by clicking this button here to make sure it goes back to the first frame. You can also hit the home button. The end button goes to the last frame, the home button goes to the first frame. That's a standard convention across any software that has a timeline. So I'm on the first frame and now I'm just going to set a key in my translate and set a key in my rotate. So we have a keyframe enabled. If we move off that frame now we can see this little blue mark down here which is just telling us that there is a keyframe on that. And if I put my cursor now on that frame you can see that goes blue. That tells us that there's a keyframe active on that particular frame. Okay, so now I'm just going to hit the end button just to jump to the last frame. And I'm just going to change the Z translation. I'll just give it a value of 1. Okay. So, something weird's happened here. So let's scrub the timeline. In fact, let's, uh, let's play it through first so that it, uh, so it caches. Um, it shouldn't take too long because I've got the, uh, I've got the proxy render on. Once it's cached, we'll be able to scrub the timeline. You can see that um, we've exposed the boundaries of, the, um, uh, of, of each of the individual layers, uh, which obviously isn't going to wash when it comes to our final, uh, our final shot. But one thing we can do at this stage now, now that it's cached, is we can start to look at the relative parallax of the layers. We can see the foreground, we can see the rocks, we can see the distant rocks, we can see the sky, and obviously we can see the tower and the foreground objects a little bit later on in the comp. And we can start to assess how they're parallaxing, how they're moving against each other, and whether we need to make any changes in the Z-axis. So, for example... I don't feel that there's a great deal of difference between these mountains and this mountain and yet they look like they're quite considerably far apart so what I will do is I'll just come back to my mid mountains my, my main mountains and I can see that they're at a set of nine and these are my distant mountains at a set of, of ten so I'm just going to push those back a little bit further so they're a bit further away from the um, from, from the mid mountains. We'll just have to preview that again. Every time we make a change unfortunately it will clear the cache and we will have to uh, have to run that preview. So this is, you know, it's, it's trial and error but it's informed trial and error. We're just looking to get a little bit more separation there between the um, between the, the, this, this mountain range here on the left and this mountain range that's presenting on the right. Okay, so I can see more defined parallax now between the two layers. If you look at the sort of the snowy areas on this uh, against these rocks, you can kind of see the separation around here. For example, you can see that separation acting a little bit, a little bit more now. It just feels a little bit more natural. Um, what I don't feel is that now that there's good parallax between these distant mountains and the sky elements. So I think what I'd be, what I'd be looking to do in that particular case is push the sky much further back. So. It's currently on 15, and I may be able to put that something like 25, um, and that will, uh, and then I should I should see parallax now between the sky. If we just take a look at these sky peaks as I just jump from one frame to the next, just looking to see if there's evidence, and I can see parallax now uh, between the mountains and the sky. Okay. So if I just flip into the into the top view and we just take a look at my camera move that's all it is in fact I'm actually coming outwards and I did that on purpose to, to show that we're actually sort of breaking the boundaries of the image by coming out of the image from from world space zero if we'd started inside the image so say for example just here on the camera if that original if that original value was one for example now let's come back into 2d so we can see this in fact, minus one. So it's actually further in the image. Whoops, I've added a keyframe accidentally. So I will just jump into the dope sheet and delete that. See how that is? I was on frame two when I when I made that change, so I'm just deleting that out. So set that to minus one. 
So now I can come to the I come to frame 100 and set that to zero now. So now we're actually pulling outwards, but we're pulling outwards from a slightly more advanced position. So we retain the integrity of our image. Just jump randomly between frames and we can see that that's now pulling out. But because we, at the beginning we were actually more advanced into the shot, then we don't reveal the boundaries of our, um, of our matte painting. Okay, so let's try and get our matte paint, our animation a little bit, or our camera animation a little bit, um, a little bit better. So I'm on frame 100, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the camera, not that much, just going to take the camera up a couple of hundreds in um, in the in the Y translation. In fact. May just go a little bit further than that, and then change the the X rotation. And what I'm doing here is I'm just changing the I'm changing the angle of the camera, so we can see the camera's just slightly tilted up now and is slightly below world space zero. So we're kind of looking up into the scene, and it's allowed us to just to reveal. Uh, this little area of rock, which is uh, in itself is going to allow us to see sort of a little bit of parallax change as that comes through. Now at the moment, that's kind of like our finishing position, and because we haven't changed those values on the, um, oh, uh, we haven't changed those values at all at this end of the at this end of it, then we're obviously going to get some uh, we're, we're going to get some quite radical changes. So if we just start to scrub, you can see that there's quite a lot. There's quite a lot going on from that original position there, where we don't see anything of the of the ground. We're actually seeing the camera go down and start to rotate up at the same time. So we're starting to see parallax on the vertical plane as well as the as well as the horizontal plane now. But you can see that we extend way too far. So we're going to need to do something about that. This is very much about trial and error and playing with things. At the moment, we're starting to reveal some unwanted areas of layers. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the keyframes from my um, from from my Y from my Y translation. So I'm going to say no animation in there, please. And then in my rotation, I'm going to say no animation in there, please. Okay, so. I've retained the parameter changes of 3 in the rotation and minus 0 0.3 in the Y translation, but I've, uh, but I've retained the, the camera push out. So we're not getting any interpolation between the, um, between the, ro the, the X rotation and the Y translation. So we're getting a much more standard sort of pullback of the camera but we're getting that from that from those changed positions a slight bit of rotation and a slight bit of um, of, of a slightly lower camera there's all sorts of things that you can do at this particular point you could experiment for example with uh, with trying to move the camera to the side a little bit maybe some slight rotation at that particular point but of course remember the problem with doing that you can see that what that's going to do is that's going to take the camera uh, the, ca the camera outside of the boundaries of the of the or it's going to take the cards outside of the boundaries of the of the camera frustum and of course the consequence of that is going to be that you're going to expose so you can see that one's okay uh, at that particular point but you can see there's a gap there. That one's okay, just. But that one, there's a gap there. So gaps form, and this is where you can do one of two things. You can go back to Photoshop and you can extend. You can maybe, um, you know, you can maybe alter the size of the cards. So there's a few things that you can do to fix that. So you, so horizontal horizontal movements are not out of bounds for this particular approach. 
so that needs to be said. It's just that it's going to create additional fixes that are going to need to be uh, are going to need to be resolved. Okay, so I'm just going to come back to the dope sheet and delete those keyframes that I put in there to create that sort of that demonstration of the uh, of the horizontal movement. So we're back to our original camera move. Not particularly imaginative, but it does prove the concept. I'm just going to finish this off just by reinstating that global color correction that I had in my in my scene. I'm going to apply that after this so that it's not applying the color correction to areas that are outside of the boundaries. Um, so I'll just put a grade in here. And the image before, what did it have? Um, so let's go into the into the gain. It had more blue. It had, I think it had more of that. I think it had more saturation. So let's come into the midtones and uh, certainly didn't want to change the offset. We could play around with these. Uh, we could play around with these values, but anyway, that's how we would apply a color correction to this. Uh, regarding the um, the, sh the ground shadow, you can see that that is uh, that is just uh, that's just here. Second one along. So I could maybe add a, a multiply node in into here. Don't want that intersecting and then bring the value of that down reinstate my tower card just to get that back and you can see how with the multiply node I can use that just to manage the the intensity of that shadow um, I could also put a put a blur in here if I if I wanted to blur it out a little bit more This is basically the approach that you should be taking with your assignment. So I wish you well with it. This is the end of the tutorial. Um, and, uh, you know, engage with the materials, then apply these, apply the learning to your assignment, and you should end up with a nice, compelling little matte painting.